Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all doing super, super well. So welcome to today's true crime video. Before we get into the video, I did wanna give a quick shout out to my girl Paulina. She's a friend of mine that just started a personal styling business and she has really helped me redefine my closet, get my outfits together and just amp up my fashion game, you guys, because let me tell you, it was lagging. Like I'm good at makeup, I'm good at hair, but when it comes to fashion, I literally have no clue what I'm doing so she offers a handful of services where she can help you clean out your closet if you feel like it's just like a hot mess you don't really have clothes that match you don't really know what you're doing she can go in there and get you some staple items that will help you maximize your clothes she can also help you if you're going on a trip or you have a big event coming up like your birthday an anniversary a vacation anything you want she can help style you for that specific event pretty much every single big event that I had in 2021 Polina was there to help me out she styled me for my trip to New York with Ipsy. She styled me for Baja Fest. She styled me for Big Bear. And now for my upcoming trip to Europe, she's also helping me out. So if you're someone that struggles with finding outfits for a trip, don't worry, Paulina's got you. So if you guys are interested in revamping your closet or getting styled for an upcoming trip or event, you guys can get $10 off Paulina services if you guys let her know that I sent you. I will have all of her social media and her styling page linked down below so you guys can check her out. She's a small Latina business owner, so it would mean a lot to me if you guys could go support her and show her business some love. All right, so back to today's video. Today we're gonna be talking about what happened to 20 year old Molly McLaren. This was a highly requested case and I actually got a lot of tags on TikTok asking me to look into it. And once I read about this case, I was extremely upset. It was a really hard case to research, but I feel like sharing her story is so important and it brings a lot of awareness to stalking. I am going to be talking about stalking in this video. So if that's something that triggers you, then I wouldn't recommend watching this video. So so yeah you guys that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about today i really appreciate you guys being here watching my videos and supporting this channel yeah i think that's pretty much all i have to say let's jump right into today's video So Molly McLaren is a 23-year-old girl from Chatham, Kent, England. Her parents are Joanne and Douglas McLaren, and she has an older brother named Tom. Molly is described as being a beautiful, loving, and kind-hearted girl. She was very friendly, so she had a lot of friends, and anytime she met someone new, she would make them feel so welcomed. She was also really close to her family and enjoyed spending time with her parents. They had such a cute relationship, and watching interviews with her parents, it just, you know, it really tugs at your heart because you can tell that they had such a special relationship. Molly was also an A-grade student in her second year at the University of Kent. She aspired to promote and advise people about health, fitness, and well-being, which is what her degree entailed. When she told her family what she was going to be studying, they were a little bit concerned. This is because Molly had suffered from eating disorders in the past. She had bulimia in the past, and it was such a difficult time for Molly and for her family. Every single day that Molly woke up, she had to make a conscious decision to make sure that this eating disorder did not control her life. So her family was worried that by her studying fitness and health and diets and things like that, that it might trigger Molly and make her go back to her eating disorder. But Molly said it did the complete opposite. She said that by studying how to actually be healthy and the correct way to be fit, it really helped her get over her eating disorder. And she was super happy to be studying this. And it did seem as if Molly was doing much better. She made a lot of friends at the university. She was studying really hard. She was getting good grades. She was working out a lot with her friends and she even decided to start her own fitness blog where she would post her workouts and her fitness journey. Get to the same bit every day. I feel like I'm lagging. Everyone gets that bit. Just got to push through. It is not pretty. Just keep going. Besides running her blog, she also got a part-time job at Ted Baker, which is where she met one of her closest friends named Amy Lee. She also worked as a barmaid in the past at the Leather Bottle Pub in Cobham, Kent. Sorry if I pronounced that city name wrong. 
So Molly never really had a lot of boyfriends. She wanted to find the right person that she was compatible with and really fit the type of visions and dreams that she had for the future, but she was really struggling to find the right person. It was also really hard for her to balance everything. I mean, she's at the university, she's studying a lot, she's running her blog, she has all these jobs, and she's trying to balance her friends, her family. Like, it was just really hard for her to get into the dating game. So she decided to download Tinder and see if that could help her out. So in July of 2016, Molly got a match on Tinder. She matched with then 20-year-old Joshua Stimson. He was a warehouse worker from Woodham, England, and he seemed like he was the perfect match for Molly. They both had a passion for fitness, they both really cared about mental and physical health, and they both just seemed like they were on like the same spiritual level. They also had a lot in common when it came to their mental health. They both had struggled with anxiety and depression, and it seemed like they were bonding over their past struggles. Joshua told Molly that he had bipolar disorder, and Molly told Joshua about her history with eating disorders, so they felt like they could really help each other deal with their emotions and deal with their past issues. So they were talking pretty much every single day and Molly's friends and family were super happy for her. Like Molly just looked so glowing, she was happy, she was excited to be talking about this person that had the same interests as her and she just seemed really happy that she finally had found someone that she felt like she could really connect with. So everyone was super excited for Molly and they told her, you know what, I, I cannot wait to meet this Joshua guy, when can we meet him? But Molly said that she wanted to take things slow, she wanted to really get to know this guy before she met him face to face, so it wasn't until four months later in November of 2016 that she finally met Joshua in person. When Joshua met Molly's family, everything seemed great. Molly's parents said that he was very nice, he was well-mannered, good-looking, very talkative, and he just seemed to vibe with the family really well. Her family welcomed him with open arms and everyone really liked Joshua. He actually ran the London Marathon to help raise money for other people with bipolar disorder and Molly and her mom Joanne actually went to go watch him run this race and at the race is where they met Joshua's parents. So it seems like the relationship was moving pretty well. As I mentioned earlier, they both had a passion for fitness, health, well-being, so they would constantly be going to the gym together, they would go on walks together, and they would constantly be hanging out with Molly's friend group. Molly had a lot of friends and almost every single weekend she had plans with the group. So now that she was dating Joshua, she wanted to include Joshua in her friend group. And Molly's friends didn't mind that Joshua would always tag along. However, Molly's friends and her family did realize that Joshua never introduced Molly to any of her friends. He never mentioned a classmate, he never mentioned a friend from school, nothing. Anytime they would go out as a group, it would always be with Molly's friends and everyone just thought that was a little bit weird, like did Joshua not have any friends or why didn't he want to introduce Molly to anybody in his life? So every single Sunday, Joshua would play football with a local team and he never invited Molly, her friends, or her parents to go watch him, which they thought was really weird. Like, why wouldn't you want your girlfriend to go watch you play soccer? Why wouldn't you want the family to go? And they would ask Joshua if they could go watch him and he kept saying no. Now in hindsight, they do realize that that was a little bit weird and it was probably because Joshua didn't want any of the guys on the football team to look at Molly. He would also spend almost every single weekend at Molly's house. He spent more time at Molly's house with Doug than he did at his own house and with his own father. Even on Father's Day, he wanted to spend it with Douglas. At first, the family didn't mind that Joshua would be spending the weekends there, but after a while, it did get a little bit weird. For example, if Molly told him that she couldn't go to the movies or she couldn't go on a date with him because she needed to study for an exam, he would get upset about that and instead of just giving her time to study, do her own thing, he would literally go inside her bedroom, sit on the bed, and just watch her study. That's a little bit strange. Like, why not give your girlfriend some space if she she needs to get some work done. Why do you need to be sitting there just staring at her? So after a while, Molly's family started to notice this and they just didn't think that that was right. Even Molly's friends began to notice that his behavior was changing. If Molly said she wanted to go hang out with her friends or she wanted to go do something on campus, he would manipulate her and tell her, oh, why are you gonna go spend time with them instead of spending time with me? Or, you know what, you don't really need to study right now, how about we spend some quality time together? And at first she would kind of listen to him and she'd be like, okay, that's fine, like I'll spend time with you. But after a while she'd be like, no, like I need to go spend time with my friends or I need to study. And he would get very upset. 
He would also insist on going everywhere Molly went. So if it was going to be a girl's night, you know, just the girls, go to a restaurant, have some yummy food, you know, some girl time, he would invite himself and he would show up. And Molly's friends, of course, were like, this is a little bit weird. Like, why can't he just let you be with girls? But apparently Joshua wasn't a fan of girls night and just didn't want to let Molly out of his sight. He even quit his job so that he could spend more time with Molly quit his job you guys like that is actually insane it's not like they were barely seeing each other like they were literally together almost every single day so when joshua told molly that he quit his job molly was annoyed like she was already feeling suffocated she was already feeling frustrated with the relationship one time she even texted joshua and told him listen we cannot be together 24 7 like it's just not good i feel very pressured right now and i just don't think it's correct and apparently Joshua got very upset and he sent her some really cruel text messages, which of course shocked Molly. Like she was not expecting that reaction from him. Besides going with Molly everywhere she went, he was also trying to turn Molly against her friends. So Molly had introduced Joshua to one of her university friends named Amelia, and she said that when she met Joshua, he was really dry towards her. Like it didn't seem as if he cared to get to know her, as if he wanted to have a conversation with one of Molly's closest friends. So Amelia made a random joke just to kind of lighten the conversation, and apparently this joke made Joshua very upset. Later, when it was just him and Molly, he told Molly that he didn't appreciate Amelia's joke he didn't think that she was a good friend and he was basically trying to manipulate Molly into thinking that Amelia was not a good person I feel like when your partner tries to do that about every single person in your life it's definitely toxic and it's a sign that they're trying to isolate you not only was Joshua jealous of Molly's friends, he was also jealous of her family. Her family, you guys, like that is just, oh, it just, it's so frustrating. So Molly and Joshua had gone to the city of Exus with her parents to celebrate her aunt's 60th birthday. Molly was super excited about this trip because she was going to be able to bond with her cousins, her family, and it was also a great way to introduce Joshua to the rest of her family. She thought they were all going to have an amazing time together, but unfortunately, that's not what happened. Throughout the entire celebration, Joshua had a grumpy face on. He looked very annoyed. He was just sitting at a table by himself, not wanting to socialize with Molly's parents, with her cousins, her aunts, her uncles, nobody. Of course, Molly was trying to have fun and she wanted to spend time with her family. So at one point, she got on the dance floor and was dancing with a few of her cousins and some of her nieces. So it wasn't like she was dancing with some random dudes. Like this is literally blood relatives that she was dancing with. And this made Joshua so angry. He was just sitting at the table, giving Molly a horrible stare. And people noticed, like Molly's parents noticed this and were like, what is wrong with this guy? Like, why is he upset that Molly's dancing with her family? One of Molly's relatives actually told her parents that they did not like Joshua and that there was something off about him. So after the party was over, Molly, Joshua, and her parents went back to the hotel and started getting ready for bed. Later in the night, Joanne got a message from Molly asking her to come into her room and that Joshua was acting crazy. So Joanne immediately goes into her daughter's room and as soon as she walks through the door, Joshua comes up to her with her cell phone in his hand and is like, look at this, look at what your daughter's doing. And she's kind of like taken back. She's like, why are you like rushing at me with your phone? Like, I don't even know what's going on. So she tells Joshua, I'm not gonna pay attention to you right now. And she turns towards her daughter and is like, Molly, tell me what's going on. Molly tells her, that Joshua and her have been fighting and that he started recording her and wanted to use these recordings as evidence against her. She did not feel comfortable that Joshua was recording her without her consent and she thought the situation was really weird. I'm not really sure how things ended up settling down, but Joanne said that at that moment, she knew something was not right with Joshua. And Molly felt the same way. She later told her mom that she no longer had the same feelings for Joshua as she did at the beginning and that she knew she needed to break up with him. So once the trip comes to an end and everybody goes back home, Molly breaks up with Joshua. She tells Joshua that she still feels suffocated and that he's being very controlling and that she cannot handle it anymore. 
I'm not really sure how Joshua took the breakup, but they did spend some time apart and it wasn't until a few months later that Joshua tried to contact Molly again. He kept sending her messages, asking her to give him one more chance. He told her he was going to change, that things were going to be different now. And Molly was kind of thinking about it. I mean, he really manipulated her into thinking that things were going to change. And her friends and family were like, no, don't take him back. He's not going to change. This was the right decision to do don't take him back. But unfortunately, Molly did. She felt really bad. She was worried about his mental health and she really believed that things were going to change. However, they didn't. Joshua was still toxic. He was still controlling. I mean, nothing changed. So in May of 2017, Molly decides to take a vacation with Joshua, just the two of them, to see if that could help. She was hoping that this vacation would help them reconnect, but it did the complete opposite. The entire time she was on this vacation, she was texting her friends back at home and telling them how she was having the worst vacation of her life and just couldn't wait to go back home. She said that Joshua was still being controlling, he was still being toxic. He wasn't listening to her feelings. She told her friends that as soon as they get back from this vacation, she's going to break up with Joshua for good. So Molly and Joshua get back from their trip and she still hasn't broken up with him. She was kind of waiting to see if things would improve and she just didn't really know how to break up with him. So then on Saturday, June 17th, 2017, Molly is out with her friends having a late birthday celebration. She had just turned 23 in May and her friends wanted to take her out for a couple of drinks. Since her and Joshua were still technically together, she invited Joshua to come along. But of course, Joshua had to ruin the night. I'm not sure what the issue was, but they began to argue in front of everybody and this just made Molly snap. So she decided to pull Joshua to the side and she ended things with him. She told Joshua she no longer wanted to be in a relationship with him and this made Joshua very angry. He started to be very aggressive and he just got up from the table and started shouting at everybody, look, she just broke up with me, she's finished with me and he made this huge drama show and then stormed out of the restaurant. She says that she felt like a weight was lifted off her shoulders. So a couple of nights had gone by since Molly had broken up with Joshua Joshua and she was starting to feel bad. He had told her that he didn't really appreciate how she broke up with him publicly and how she definitely could have approached it in a different way. So she started to believe him. She felt like she shouldn't have done it publicly, that it was wrong of her, and she started to feel bad. However, even though she felt bad, she still wasn't going to get back together with him. So a few days go by and Molly is still not talking to Joshua. She still is not reversing her decision and getting back together with him. So of course, this made Joshua angry. I think he really believed he was going to be able to manipulate Molly by telling her like a sob story of oh my god I'm so embarrassed and so hurt that you broke up with me in front of your friends like you shouldn't have done that I think he thought Molly was gonna be like you know what yeah like I shouldn't have done that let's get back together but when that didn't work Joshua decided to become aggressive and he started posting these really cruel things about Molly on Facebook he would make these posts public and he would tag Molly's parents so that they could see it so he would make posts saying that Molly is talking sick, that she's crazy, that she's a liar, that she does drugs. Of course, her family knew that all of these things were lies and they started to get worried as well. I mean, this guy is not handling this breakup well. He's spreading these lies about Molly. They just really didn't like how this was affecting Molly's mental health. So the entire family, including Molly, blocked Joshua on social media and reported his post to Facebook. Thankfully, Facebook did remove all of Joshua's posts, but the family still decided to keep him blocked because they just no longer wanted anything to do with Joshua. So then on June 20th, 2017, Molly decides to apply for a job as a receptionist at the Nuffield Gym in Medway Valley Park. She was so ready to move on with her life. She was excited to continue going to school. She was excited for this new job. She was just ready to forget Joshua. At this point, she thought that things had calmed down because Joshua hadn't messaged her in a while. He hadn't put anything on Facebook. He hadn't called her. So she just assumed that everything was going to go back to normal. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Joshua began posting his cruel messages on Facebook once again. He was texting Molly, he was calling her, he was trying to get back into her life, and he was becoming very aggressive. 
This is when Molly says, enough, I can't handle this anymore. And she decides to go to the police station and make a report against Joshua. So Molly prints out all of the messages Joshua has sent her, all of the stuff he's put on Facebook. And she goes to the police station with her mom and tells the police everything. So the police officer calls Joshua and he puts him on speakerphone. He tells him, listen, you need to stop contacting Molly. You need to stop making these posts on Facebook and you need to leave her alone or we're going to go after you. Joshua Joshua replies with, I have done nothing wrong, and if you think I have, there is yet to come. Joanne says that when Joshua said those words, she got the chills and she just felt very scared. She said Joshua sounded so cold and emotionless when he said that. And I mean, what kind of a threat is that saying there's yet to come? It was very frightening for Molly and for Joanne. So the police decide to run a background check on Joshua just to see if he has any type of criminal record. And when they did this background check, it came back clean. So at this point, Molly and Joanne don't really know what else they can do. So they they decided to print photos of Joshua and hand them to the people in the neighborhood. They just wanted people to be aware of this guy and they told them, listen, if you see this guy roaming around the neighborhood, let me know or call the police immediately. So a few days after the police contacted Joshua, he decides to join the same gym that Molly had applied to to be a receptionist. That same day, police speak to Joshua once again because he still didn't stop posting on Facebook. So the police call him once again and they're like, listen, you need to stop. Like, this is your final warning. And Joshua says, okay, yeah, whatever. Like, he doesn't even really care what police are saying. Then at around 5 p.m. that day, Joshua buys a knife from an Asda store and then a few hours later, he purchased is a pickaxe. There's actually surveillance footage of Joshua doing all this and it's kind of crazy when you watch it because he appears so calm. He doesn't look stressed. He doesn't look nervous. I mean, it looks like he doesn't have a care in the world. So then on June 28th, 2017, Molly posts a selfie on Instagram about her plans for a night out at the Ship and Trades pub in Chatham. As I mentioned earlier, Molly, her friends, and her family had blocked Joshua on all of her social media, so she wasn't worried about posting her location because she knew that Joshua wouldn't be able to see it. At least that's what she thought. It turns out that Joshua had convinced an unnamed girl to add Molly on social media and let him know wherever she was and what she was posting, which honestly is really scary when you think about it. I feel like the majority of the people don't really think about what they're posting on Facebook or on social media. You know, you'll just post that you're at Disneyland or that you're at this restaurant or at this bar. And I feel like sometimes we don't really think about who can see that information. It's honestly really scary. And something that I do is that I don't post my location when I'm there. Like for example, a few days ago, I went to this restaurant called Barton G's and I was posting my food. I was posting the entire experience, but I wasn't posting it when I was physically there. That's just like a little tip I have. Don't post where you are at the moment. So anyways, Molly uploads this photo saying she's going to this bar later at night and this unnamed girl forwards the photo to Joshua and now he knows where Molly is going to be. So later that night, Molly is at this pub with her friends having a good time when all of a sudden Joshua walks inside the pub with another girl. It appears as if he was on a date and he makes sure to walk past the table where Molly and her friends are sitting at just to ensure that Molly sees him. I feel like he was trying to make Molly jealous by walking past her table with another girl, but Molly said she didn't really care. Like she saw him with another girl and she was like, great. I could care less, which really proved to Molly that she no longer loved or cared for Joshua. So throughout the night, Molly didn't speak to Joshua and Joshua didn't speak to Molly. It was as if they didn't know each other and as if they didn't exist. So towards the end of the night, Molly decides that she's ready to go home, she heads into the parking lot, gets inside her car and heads home. The next morning on June 29th, Molly wakes up in the morning and decides to go to the gym. She was going to the Pure Gym at the Dockside Retail Outlet in Chatham, Kent. She arrives to the gym at around 10 o'clock in the morning. She goes into this workout room that she pretty much has all to herself, which made Molly really happy because she was planning on recording some of her workouts for her class and for her blog. So she was happy that there was no one else around her and she could just kind of work out and be by herself. 
However, that would quickly change. At around 10.25 in the morning, Joshua walks into the gym. He starts heading up the stairs that lead to the workout room where Molly's at, and he reaches the top of the stairs. He notices that Molly's in there by herself, and then he decides to go back downstairs, but stops. He decides to make a U-turn and go back upstairs. He enters the same room as Molly, and he lays his workout mat right next to her. Now Molly's in the middle of a workout so she doesn't immediately notice Joshua. It wasn't until she turned to the side and saw that her ex-boyfriend was there working out right next to her. She got really startled when she saw him and she kind of just like sat back and stared at him. I think she was shocked and she couldn't believe that this was really happening. I mean, what are the odds that last night he showed up at the same pub where she was at with her girlfriends and now the next morning he shows up at the same gym as her? So she texts her mom at around 10.45 in the morning and tells her that Joshua has turned up at the gym and has come up next to her. Then she takes this photo of Joshua and sends it to her friend Amy also letting her know that Joshua is there. Amy thought this was really weird and she told Molly that something wasn't right. So then Molly goes up to Joshua and we're not really sure what she tells him. The police assume that she asked Joshua if he was following her and he kind of just ignored her. Then she walks back to her mat and at around 10.57 in the morning, Joshua leaves the gym. So Joanne actually calls Molly just to get an update on the situation and Molly says that she's in the woman's locker room just waiting to see if he has finally left. Joanne tells her, okay, that's fine, but please just go straight home as soon as you can and drive safely. Then at around 11.01, she sends a message to her mom telling her that she's finally leaving the gym and she heads towards the parking lot. She also sends a text message to her friend Amy saying that she feels like she's looking over her shoulder all the time. Amy replies back saying, don't talk to him, just get out and leave ASAP. Molly tells her, yes, I'm walking to my car now, which then Amy replies to by saying, don't worry about him, he's a psycho. Molly reads her message, but never replies back. At this point, Molly was getting into the driver's side of her car, and before she had a chance to drive out, Joshua ran up to her car, opened the door, jumped inside, and began attacking Molly. She tried to fight him off. She was screaming, she was scratching at his face, she was pushing him off as hard as she could. She even was honking her horn to let people know. A passerby named Benjamin Morton heard Molly screaming, heard this attack, and he tried to help her. He tried to pull Joshua off of her, but his leg was so slippery because it was covered in Molly's blood that he couldn't get a good grip on him. So anytime he tried to pull Joshua off, he would slip. So then he tried to slam the door on Joshua's leg because it was still hanging out of Molly's car and that's when Joshua pulled his leg back into the car, closed the door and continued to attack Molly. Benjamin says that he quickly looked at Molly and he knew that there was nothing else he could do. I'm not going to get into too many details because it is very graphic, but he ended up stabbing Molly over 75 times. It is absolutely horrific and just one of the most evil things I've ever heard. So the police arrive to the scene and when they pull up, they find Joshua pacing back and forth in the parking lot covered in Molly's blood. He goes up to one of the police officers and tells them, she's in the car, I've killed her. The medics get to Molly and they try to save her, but there was just nothing they could do. She had been stabbed over 75 times and she had died within minutes of the attack. It's really crazy because Molly's friends and family didn't even know about this. It wasn't until her friend Amy received a text message from another friend asking her, have you seen what happened at Dockside? And Amy said no. So she googled it and she read a story about how a woman had just been stabbed in the parking lot and was deceased. So she didn't really think that it was Molly, but she decided to call Molly, send her a text message just to get an update from her, but Molly never replied back. This is when Amy started to connect the dots and she wondered, could this unidentified victim be Molly? This was kind of the same situation for Molly's mom, Joanne. One of Molly's friends had texted Joanne with an article that said that an incident had occurred at the Dockside retail outlet, and Joanne says that when she read this article, she immediately knew it was her daughter. Her mom was literally speaking to her, telling her to come straight home, telling her to drive safely, and then two minutes later, Molly was brutally stabbed to death. 
I mean, I can't even begin to imagine how Molly's mom feels, as well as her friend Amy. I mean, they both were literally texting Molly minutes before this happened. It's just, it's truly heartbreaking. To make matters worse, Molly's father, Doug, was 100 miles away on a work trip on a ship all by himself. So Joanne sent him an email saying, you need to call me ASAP. So Doug calls Joanne and she had to tell him, your daughter's been murdered. She said it was the most difficult thing she's ever had to do because she knew that Doug was all by himself on this ship. There was no one there that was going to be able to give him a hug, be able to comfort him, be able to just be there for him. He immediately got off the boat and headed back home so he could see his daughter. Doug and Joanne were able to see Molly one last time on a gurney outside of the hospital, which they said was very difficult. I mean, seeing your daughter there lying on this gurney, lifeless, and just knowing that you're never going to be able to talk to her again. I swear, watching the interviews with Joanne and Doug, you cry. Like, I want to cry right now just like remembering it because they loved Molly so much. It's just so upsetting and extremely unfair. So the family eventually had a funeral for Molly and it was absolutely beautiful. A lot of people showed up to the funeral and so many people gave such beautiful speeches about the kind of person Molly was. When Molly's class finally graduated from college, Joanne and Doug went to the ceremony on behalf of Molly. Like wow, Molly's parents are just such incredibly strong people. So Joshua was arrested and he was in custody awaiting his trial. He decided to plead not guilty and he made Molly's family go through an entire trial. I mean, he could have saved everybody the time and the stress and the pain of going through a trial because he did it. Like there's literally proof of him covered in blood. There's proof he did it. They had found the weapons inside his car. I don't really know how he thought he was going to get away with this. He was claiming that he was unaware of his actions and that he didn't plan this. His defense team tried to argue that he was suffering from an emotionally unstable personality disorder with a hypersensitivity to rejection, which is why he lost control and did what he did. However, a psychiatrist on the prosecution side said that Joshua was focused and in control when he did the attack. Like he knew what he was doing and the fact that after he left the gym, he was just waiting in the parking lot for Molly to come out. It was definitely premeditated murder. However, the defense team was trying to make it seem as if stalking was not in Joshua's personality, but the prosecution was able to find two of Joshua's ex-girlfriends and put them on the stand. One of his ex-girlfriends is Alexandra Dale, and when she went on the stand, she said that she had met Joshua through Facebook a couple of years ago and noticed that he was very obsessive and strange. So she decided to break things off with him, and he did not take it well whatsoever. One morning, she woke up and she noticed that the tires in her car had been slashed and then on another occasion she had received a text message from Joshua of him in her backyard insinuating that he was watching her. So she was fed up with all of this harassment and she decided to file a report against Joshua to her local police. So after three hours of deliberation, the jury sentenced Joshua Stimson to life in prison with a minimum of 26 years. Molly's family was really happy with this decision, but of course they knew that this wasn't going to bring Molly back. So. so after Molly's death, her friends and family set up the Molly McLaren Foundation, which raised thousands of dollars for charity. These charities would then distribute the money to groups that support people with eating disorders. The family really wanted to help raise awareness on eating disorders since Molly had battled with bulimia for such a long time. I will have all of their links in the description down below if you guys want to go check them out. But Besides wanting to raise awareness on eating disorders, Molly's family also wants to raise awareness to the dangers of stalking. They did the most that they could to protect Molly. It's just so unfortunate that Joshua had to take her life away over what? It just really isn't fair. I mean, Molly had such a beautiful and long life ahead of herself. So yeah, you guys, that's pretty much all the information I have on today's case. I will leave some resources down below that can help you if you believe that you're being stalked. There is a hotline that you guys can call 24-7. So all of that helpful information will be linked down below.
All right, you guys, I would really love to hear your opinion on this case. And if you guys have any other cases you guys want me to cover in the future, make sure to leave it in the comment section down below, por favor. Also, don't forget to subscribe before you guys leave so you guys can join the familia. And yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye, guys.